Welcome to Forbes Talks. Joining me now is Matt Craig, assistant editor here at Forbes. Matt, thank you so much for joining me thank in you. person. Appreciate it. Of course. So, as you've reported, the esports company FaZe Clan had a really tumultuous 2022. And there are reports and serious questions on if they can survive going long term. So, let's start at the beginning of the year at the Super Bowl when FaZe seemed like it was on top of the world. Walk us through that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, FaZe Clan is one of those companies that is at the forefront of not just gaming, but youth culture. At this point, they wouldn't even consider themselves an esports organization so much as like a media and lifestyle brand. And at the Super Bowl, uh, Snoop Dogg was performing and he was he wore a FaZe Clan chain and obviously hundreds, 100 million people watched the Super Bowl. Um, so it really felt like they had entered the mainstream. And with that announcement came the fact that, oh, Snoop Dogg is gonna be a member of FaZe Clan. So kind of, again, further identification with the mainstream. And at that point, it really felt like FaZe Clan was the most important esports organization in the world and maybe uh, ready to make a lot of money. It didn't quite work out that way, I don't think. Yeah, so let's start with that partnership with Snoop. How much did that cost? Yeah, so there's kind of until, so FaZe went public in July and had to disclose all these things. Until that happened, I think there was somewhat of a feeling that these people that became members of FaZe Clan did so because it was the cool thing to do, right? And let's just stop right there. Can you explain what being a member of FaZe Clan is? Honestly, no. And that that's kind of part of the point is that it, a lot of it is just this title, you know? Okay. Um, and Snoop's not even the first celebrity that has been a member of FaZe Clan. Lil Yachty, Kyler Murray, Bronny James, right? And it turns out a lot of these are just paid sponsorships from FaZe Clan to these celebrities to associate their brands with FaZe's brand. So in the case of Snoop Dogg, it was $2.6 million in company stock uh, for him and also like his family and friends, a couple other companies, um, for two years where he would be considered a member and he would promote FaZe uh, on his social channels. However, FaZe doesn't monetize Snoop's socials or make any other money off of him other than just the brand association, which kind of gets back to the fundamental question of FaZe, which is build up the brand, build up the brand, build up the brand, and don't really think too much about how much money we are spending or making. So was this enormous and expensive partnership worth it? I mean, it remains to be seen. FaZe, the brand is large, and at least within like the esports and gaming space or amongst people in that Gen Z generation, FaZe is seen as this like aspirational cool kids club. So you could say that, you know, signing Snoop up helps with that. The question is, are they gonna run out of money? Are they gonna run out of runway before they're able to fully capitalize on that brand? I think the question is, how does FaZe make money? Yeah, so they make money um, in the traditional ways. You know, esports teams win, they partner with these content creators uh, and get a portion of their revenue. But I do think it's very important to talk about the, the, that actual revenue split. Because in order to get premium talents, you have to give them the lion's share of, of these revenues. But they report all those revenues as company revenues. However, it could be as much as 80% of money made stays with the content creator who makes it, which is great for the content creators, right? And it, it makes sense why FaZe would want to partner with them. However, the company itself is not bringing in most of the revenue that it reports to have been being made over the past year. Has FaZe ever been profitable? They've never been profitable. Uh, while they were a private company, they had no problem raising lots of private money, including celebrity investors like Pitbull and Offset and professional athletes. And those investments were able to fund the company. However, when the company went public, it's all about you know what your share price is and selling shares. Um, once some of these financial details started coming out about the company, the stock price tanked from 20 at its peak to under $2 a share. And when that happens, the company doesn't have money and it has fewer options about how to raise more. So how does the company sell itself to investors? It, sell, it sells itself to investors as, hey, there's this large number of Gen Z followers that you're having a hard time reaching through traditional advertising means. Come to us, we have, and they advertise a number, 526 million total reach across social media channels, which is very, very impressive. However, it's a little misleading because they count, for example, Snoop Dogg and these other celebrities 
in their total reach, which technically is true. However, 200 million of those 526 million, right off the bat, directly contractually obligated not to monetize, right? So that's already a smaller portion. The rest also inflated because, for example, if I follow one creator on multiple platforms, Instagram, Twitch, YouTube, it's counting me three, four times. And if okay. I follow multiple creators on multiple platforms, one person could be counted 10 times, right? Mm -hmm. So who knows what that actual total is? Um, but they still do, they do have a large audience. No matter how big it is, it is still 100 million plus. Yeah, that is huge. So what's the disconnect here? How come they cannot connect this audience to making revenue? Right. I think this is the fundamental point of my story because FaZe, yes, they have problems as a company, but I think they're very indicative of the esports industry as a whole. They're kind of just the one to point to because they went public, they have to disclose all these financial details. However, I think this same trend could be seen at other esports and gaming operations, which is, hey, we have this huge reach of audience. We're having a very hard time monetizing those clicks, those views, those people. Because, for example, when you watch a YouTube video, you don't have to pay, right? Mm -hmm. When you watch a Twitch stream, you don't have to pay. I mean, some people do, and you can pay on YouTube too. But uh, for the most part, a lot of free content. So within phase, for example, 36 cents per YouTube subscriber is their average, right? So it's just a very difficult business and no one within the industry, I think, has really cracked the code about how to translate these huge and loyal fan bases uh, into actual revenue for the company. You touched on this bumpy road that FaZe has experienced since it went public back in July. Walk us through it. Yeah, so July 20th, they go public, um, they have a SPAC, right? So they merge with another company. And unknown at the time, 92% of the SPAC shareholders actually just chose to cash out. Is that normal? It It's not at that rate, not at that rate. I mean, ultimately, you could imagine some people being like, hey, we'll, we'll take the money up front, but 92%. And FaZe was, I think, very surprised by that. They, they didn't confirm that with me, but they projected to make $218 million from the merger going public, right? they actually only made 100 million, less than half of what they expected. And because of that, they had less money to fund operations, to grow, they had planned to make acquisitions, they weren't able to do that. And overall, it's just an expensive operation to keep going, and when you make less than half of what you projected, that really starts to put you in a tough spot, which I think they realized throughout the year. So they go public in July, the stock price is doing okay. I think a lot of people thought because there weren't that many shares available, but that's speculation, right? All the way into late September, they are a billion dollar company, which is what, that's a claim they always made. We're gonna be the first esports billion dollar company. And they were right. And then once the public filing started coming out, um, we found out that their $100 million loan, 70% of that, those investors defaulted, had to be covered by the company that they merged with. Then the SPAC shareholders redeeming. At that point, people were panicking, stock starts to tank. Uh, and then when the third quarter financials came out, which painted a grim picture, the stock had fallen all the way from $20 a share to under $2, and the company is suddenly worth a little over $150 million. So was going public a good idea? They needed to go public. They needed to go public because they needed to raise money, again, to keep the operations going. You have very expensive sponsorships. You have very expensive uh, talent. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to keep growing. They wanted to keep you know, building the company. So they needed to go public just to raise the funds. So was it a good idea? Not so much because uh, of obviously what's happened since, but they were kind of between a, a rock and a hard place. That's the phrase I was just going to say. This seems like a rock and a hard place yeah. situation. So is this type of plummet so soon after going public unprecedented? Well, it's unprecedented because uh, these esports companies, most of them didn't exist 10 years ago, right? And very, very few have gone public before. What I do think is, Every company, other esports companies, has looked at FaZe and seen what happened and thought, ooh, I don't know if this is a good idea for us if we can help it. You know, if we can find another investor to come in while we're still private, get money that way, I don't think that I want to be under the same public spotlight that FaZe is under. So certainly they're setting the precedent for the rest of these other esports organizations who are in a, a similar spot. Of course, yeah, they're definitely probably looking at them saying, at least they tested the waters. Let's reassess here. But how are esports companies as a whole doing now? Well, again, it's hard to say because they're private companies. Mm -hmm. I think um, all of them have 
adopted different strategies. And I think what we, so we valued the list of esports companies uh, earlier in the year, one of my colleagues did. And what we found is the most valuable esports companies had built a lot of their business in non esports ventures. So whether that's merchandising or, for example, one esports company got a large uh, check from FTX. I don't know how that company is doing, right? you know, how they're doing with that now. But um, these companies were making money through non esports means because that they haven't really figured out how to make a lot of money through content, uh, content revenues through esports. Um, so it's, it's a grab bag. But I do think that phase, for example, if it were to go all the way under, if it were to um, go away, I think it would scare a lot of these other companies. I want to go back to that list you just uh, talked about. Phase was number four most valuable yep. esports on the Forbes list. So is this fall surprising? Yeah, it, they were, of all the teams on that list, Phase was the most difficult one to get a valuation on because at that point they hadn't gone public and they were telling people they were going to be worth a billion dollars. We, we were thinking, hey, these other companies, esports companies are like $400 million companies. So when you hear that one is more than twice as big, you, you're kind of skeptical about that, right? But this SPAC was supposed to come out, they were supposed to be a billion dollar company. And we kind of hedged, you know, we, we gave our best guess based on, you know, talking to people, based on um, all the research. But we came down at number four. Obviously, now that we know exactly what their market capitalization is at 150 million, you know, they would be much farther down the list or off the list. I, I don't know exactly what the cutoff was. Um, but yeah, it, it's a lot of hot, hot air and smoke and hype that gets pumped in before a company goes public, and then they have to start you know, posting hard financials publicly. Let's talk about that hype. So why is the company having trouble coming up with, as you described in your piece, a way to translate internet clout into a legitimate business? Yeah, well, so this is the thing, is FaZe has always been the, the coolest kids on the internet, right? They, they throw these great parties, you know, they have these celebrities, they have big followings with all their people, um, and so the brand is just extremely cool. And when you have a lot of people who are very loyal to you, that should be very valuable. Mm -hmm. That should be a group that you can, you know, theoretically build a business off of. However, as advertisers have learned for decades, young people, you know, they just, they don't have a lot of money, they don't want to spend money. And so being able to translate the audience that they have and the brand that they have into making lots and lots of money, at least to this point, hasn't happened. Got it. And you also write that being a company with designs on the future and an ambitious growth strategy operating at huge losses, like Netflix, was some paradoxical sort of recipe for success. We saw it work for Netflix. Why not FaZe? Well, first of all, I love hearing you know my own writing read, read back to me. That's you know it's making me slightly cringe. But um, is it the, I guess the question is whether that is working for Netflix, right? Because for the longest time, they were being rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. And then recently, that bubble kind of deflated, and they're, they've come back down to earth. I think you know there was a stock market environment that allowed these tech companies with grand plans. You know, people just continue to believe on them for the future. I, I talked to one analyst in the field, Mouth Men's, and he was saying that there was kind of a fear of missing out component to this. You know, if this is the future, FaZe has always talked about they're the future of entertainment. If this is the future, I want to be in at the ground level. You know, I want to mm -hmm. be here, you know, Amaz investing in Amazon in the early 2000s. Or, Apple, yeah. Or Apple, <laughs> exactly, right? And so I think a lot of people bought in on the dream, but they, they, it was kind of a, it was a feeling of hey this can only ever go up right yeah. and then as a lot of these companies have found out it now we're in a stock market environment where you need to see revenue or at least a path toward revenue and phase at least to this point hasn't really shown it Matt you're painting a pretty grim picture so what has phase said about this yeah so they first of all they're they're a promotional company as, as you might expect from what I'm telling you right they're all about promoting the brand. They're very, they say a lot of things publicly. So I assumed and hoped, you know, that, that we would get them more on the record. But when it came down to it, I think that the company is right now figuring out what they need to do in the future, right? So it was very difficult for them. We, we did end up getting a statement from their CEO, and, and he's, he's optimistic still for the future. I think that the company still believes in the long term vision of, which is. of what they can be, which is, hey, we're the future of entertainment. Mm -hmm. We still are one of the go to sources for these hard to reach customers, right? These kids, and we're building a relationship that, hey, when they grow up and they maybe start having more spending power, um, we might we could be a, a very, very rev, uh, revenue positive company, right? 
However, it's just a matter of how long can you hold on, you know? How long can you keep pouring in resources to a money-losing operation on this long-term dream and on this long-term vision? And I think that, again, I think their CEO, as they said, they're very optimistic about what the company can be. It's just a matter of can they survive until that comes. I guess that's the question. What's next for FaZe? Will they survive? I mean, if I knew the answer to that, you know, I, I would be a rich man. But I think uh, the brand itself, it's hard to see going away. Mm-hmm. They have built at least enough of a reputation at this point that even if the company were to kind of bottom all the way out, I feel like someone would buy them up or and then invest more money in, you know, um, or be willing to, to if, if like a very rich person bought them and then was willing to like lose money, um, it could happen. So I don't think phase is going away. I don't even think so they, they said in their financial reports that they have enough money until November of next year. I, I mean, that's 12 months. That's that seems like crazy to think that they would might be going to business in 12 months. So I, I think that they might have a little bit longer time than that. But again, it, it's, it's a matter of, is it going to turn around? You know, if you're an investor wanting to come into this company, do I see a path where this picture could change? And that is where they have not been able to show what that could be. Interesting. Matt Craig, thank you so much. Thank you very much.